Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we rescued two MMD1 mini micro designers, an 8-bit microcomputer trainer introduced in 1976 based on the Intel 8080 chip. Over the previous episodes, we restored both of them to working condition and then started to breadboard some upgrades. Beautiful HP displays, memory and serial I.O. So much so that we eventually ran Microsoft Basic on it, a feat that you normally associate with the much larger and well-known Altair 8800. The MMD1 is the little forgotten educational machine that could. We ended up the last episode running a program, in BASIC of course, to print a banner honoring John Titus, the designer of the MMD1. Even better, we managed to get a hold of him. So as a treat for this final episode, we are delighted to have him on Zoom, along with his partner in crime, David Larson. They'll tell us the MMD1 story in their own words, in full potato vision and underwater broccoli sound that Zoom is so well known for. D David and John, you, you guys go back a long way, right? Oh, yeah. Dave and I go back quite a ways, back to the early 70s. So Dave Larson and I were associated at Virginia Tech in the early 70s. Dave was in the chemistry department, which is where I was pursuing a PhD degree. And Dave was teaching electronics for scientists course. Uh, when I was uh, studying for my PhD in chemistry, uh, I got involved with mini computers. At that time, they were the size of a small refrigerator. I found the computers to be much more interesting than the chemistry I was involved with. <laughs> I had I had a, a research advisor who was kind of a pain in the rear end. It didn't take a whole heck of a lot uh, of interest in some of his students anyway. So I left. I didn't complete my degree. I went and started a small company with Dave and uh, Peter Roney, who was in the chemical engineering department of Virginia Virginia Tech, and my uh, brother Chris, who was in the PhD program at Virginia Tech, too, I started thinking about doing my own computer. And Intel came out with the 8008. Intel's uh, MCS8 system, uh, let me see if I got a copy of the, the, one of the manuals here, just a second. This is the original Intel development system. And it was two boards. The processor board was in the front, and this particular image shows like looks like four of the 1702a's in it and back behind it is an eprom programmer board that would program the 1702a the box itself had some lights and switches but they didn't do a whole heck of a lot they weren't connected to the computer you could connect them yourself if you wanted to and you could add a power supply but that was a pretty bare bone system and i decided i could take the intel reference design that they had published and modify it. So instead of being something that you had to load those old 1702A EPROMs into, you could toggle information in from the front panel. And that was published in Radio Electronics, July 1974 issue. That's the Go Mark ahead. 8, right? The Mark 8, that's, that's, that's correct. We, yeah, that's for it. which you became pretty famous. Yeah. I guess. You were a student at the time, right? Yeah, I was a student at Virginia Tech and uh, built it at home in my son's bedroom. I had sent a note, a query to Popular Electronics Magazine and also to Radio Electronics Magazine. I never heard anything back from uh, Popular Electronics. And I think because they probably had uh, Ed Roberts' uh, Altair project under wraps and they didn't want to give anything away. But Larry Steckler, the chief editor at Radio Electronics, said, hey, this sounds interesting. I'm going to fly down from New York City to Roanoke, Virginia. Pick me up. I want to see this thing work, which oh, okay. we did. And Larry came down. He saw it. We had dinner together. And he said, OK, let's just do this. Let's publish this. So I typed up the manuscript. And it also uh, we put together a booklet that had all the instructions in it, as well as some experiments that people could do to get them used to toggling the in the binary information. But, but that was, in a sense, the first Intel inside I, personal computer? Uh, I think so. The, the story I heard is that popular electronics who turned you down or didn't respond to you got jealous of the of the radio electronics and, and then went to uh, the, the guy that eventually did the Altair. 
Yeah, Ed Roberts. Ed Roberts, that 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 you wear you actually wear the trigger to the whole thing. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize that. I thought they had the the MITS Altair in the works perhaps at the time and just didn't correspond with me because they w would not want to say, oh yes, we knew about it, but we turned it down. Yeah, well, I don't know. I read that over the internet, so <laughs> God, knows yeah. I, God knows if you can trust that. <laughs> so that was while you were a student. David was teaching a class that you were attending, or yeah, uh, Dave and Peter Roney and my brother Chris and I formed a company, and the company was going to design elect and did design electronic equipment, as well as we wrote many, many books about electronics. Dave was the lead on that. Now, e l Instruments published the books to start. We had an agreement with e l Instruments. And, and I think there's the three of you, right? Dave, yep. Dave Peter, and, and you, John. So you, you had a relationship with e l before the MMD-1? Yes, we did. We did. Uh, did e l Instruments produce the outboard modules? Oh, yes. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah we did the teaching aids to go with our first bug books, uh, the little digital modules. And when I went up there with them, they, uh, they they produced those and sold those too. They sure did. We worked with e &L Instruments to develop another uh, 8080 computer. They wanted something that was a little bit easier to use. We had, we had done a, a computer for e &L Instruments and it didn't sell well. It, it was called the MD-80. I don't have any bits and pieces of it. I don't know anybody who does. I've never seen anything yeah, I on know, it. I've got one of the original kits there, John. Uh, it was it was more of a, based on kind of a mini computer because it had the switches and lights and so forth and mm -hmm. multiple cards plugged into a, uh, a bus and it, it was just too complicated. We all realized that the MD-80 was too complicated. And so we decided we've got to come up with a small single board computer that could be used for training. It was first called the Dyna Micro, and mm -hmm. it was also published by Radio Electronics as a project. And ENL Instruments said, okay, we want to change the name to the Mini Micro Designer or the MMD1. They provided the breadboard that had to solder through terminals. That was unique. Yeah, I, I know. I had to I had to restore this one and take it apart and put it back together. I was pretty oh. amazed at how they did that. Something else really unique about the uh, MMD-1, most of the training, the components were hidden, and all you saw were switches and lights. The really cool thing about the MMD-1, you saw everything right there on top of the board because it was a single board computer with the components showing. So the students and engineers using it, it wasn't a mystery. What's behind the box, you yes. know, or behind the panel? That was uh, that was really a great, great thing too. And of course it's given, John's given credit for the first single board computer as well. Oh, that's true. Single board yeah, it, it, That was the aim to make it an educational product. I, I want to give credit to my brother, Chris, because uh, yeah. Chris is the one who wrote the, what we call the KEX, the, yes, what yes. we call the keyboard executive. And, and he gets credit for that. He's the one who wrote the software. So David, were you still a professor at the time or, or was the, the, the company became your main, your main focus? In 1967, I was hired at Virginia Tech to teach uh, instrumentation in the chemistry department and uh, bought a PDP-8, was the first computer in the department. So went on from there, and uh, just to move rather quickly, uh, we moved into the 7400 series chips and teaching digital electronics. That's when Bug Books 1 and 2 came about, uh, you know, with just basic digital electronics, and that started the whole thing. And one thing led to another, and we got together, as John said, and formed a company with the four of us, and with him and we continued the business up until I think 81 or 82, somewhere in there. We did workshops all over the world using that MMD-1. We had a museum here in Floyd for a while, and then we sent all of our stuff down to the Computer Museum of America in yes, Roswell, so, so tell us, about, so Tell us about that. You're also on YouTube with some of your collection. Your collection was, how, how do you get into that? That was a very large collection. 
there were lots of people donated things to the collection when they were just throwing them out, you know. So we had a lot of them given to us. We bought a lot of them. We advertised in uh, Computer Shopper yeah. for years. Wanted a uh, pre-1980 microcomputer for historical collection. And I got lots and lots of computers, uh, including four Apple Ones. The Mims family down in uh, Roswell they ended up buying the collection. And it when it left here, it was... Uh, 31 tons and 13,000 items. Oh, yes. That's so it was, was big you, you, you have to, on, you have to mention you. that. That's right. yeah, that MIMS is. is a Computer Museum of America. By the way, they did change the name of that just recently. Yeah. I'm on the board down there, and we changed the name to the um, MIMS. Let's see, I did get this right anyway. It's the MIMS, MIMS art, Technology MIMS. and Art Museum or something like that. Yeah, yeah. History and Art Museum. And it's a really wonderful museum. It's big. I mean, it's a huge museum and moving on and a lot of energy going into it. Yes, and it's superbly well presented. And I, I, I didn't realize that some of the items we were uh, we liked the most, and uh, particularly they have a beautiful Mark 8 over there. And I yeah. didn't realize it came from your collection. It came from John, I suppose. John, any uh, tidbit you can share on the design of the MMD-1? I... Uh, the first one didn't work. Oh. <laughs> because I, I... How unusual <laughs> of electronics. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, though, I had designed a latch circuit into the uh, design, and it was the wrong latch I think John is referring to the 74174 latch, which watches some of the data bits. It's yet another oddity of the Intel 8080 that it briefly broadcasts important processor status bits on the data bus before the data proper appears on the bus. So you have to latch the status during the stroke pulse provided by the clock chip. But then you're not done, you need to mix them with the bus read and write pulses, with the help of a few gates to generate usable control signals. These are the signals we use for our memory and I.O. breadboarding. And since it also generates the internal memory read and write signals, it's a pretty important one to get right, or your processor won't be able to access the onboard RAM. The wrong type of latch to grip addresses, I believe. So instead of just getting a new printed circuit board, we took that one out, unsoldered it, drilled holes in the prototype board, and stuck the right chip in with a wire wrap socket. And on the back, we wire wrapped the proper connections and soldered them onto the circuit board. So the, the one that uh, is the, the first prototype was kludged together a little bit. After that, the next round, of course, worked fine. But it was kind of an interesting story. We couldn't understand at first. Why didn't this thing work? Well, wrong chip chosen. Did, did you have to prototype it on a wire wrap, or did you go straight for a prototype PCB? No, we just went with a printed circuit board. One of the uh, things that we yeah. ran into with the uh, with this whole uh, sort of repair process and uh, was the uh, 70, 1702 EPROMs, we did not actually have a programmer that was capable of programming them. And it turns out it's kind of complicated and you need some pretty high voltages. Oh, yes. How did you guys do that back in the day? Did you buy somebody's programmer or did you do it manually? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Intel's uh, MCS8 system, that mm -hmm. was an 8008. And it was two boards. The processor board was in the front and this particular image shows like looks like four of the 1702a's in it back behind it is an eprom programmer board that would program the 1702a my brother chris took the uh, the programmer board and he ran it through a copy machine and based on the schematic and what he had printed from the copier on both sides he duplicated that board and then he wrote the driver code for it too. The, the, the way it came to be is that I collected the ENL stuff and I said, oh, they made the one with a computer on it. I have to get that. And only after a while when I researched the MMD one did I find a connection to both of you and John's designs and the markets. I said, oh, no wonder it's good. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Nice chatting with yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for sure. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you.